Welcome back to another episode of Christian Natural Health. Today, I'm excited to have David Banson with us. David is the founder, managing partner, and chief investment officer of the Banson Group, a national private wealth management firm with offices in multiple states, managing $4.5 billion in client assets. And prior to launching the Banson Group, he spent eight years as managing director at Morgan Stanley and six years as a vice president at UBS. He is consistently named as one of the top financial advisors in America by Barron's, Forbes, and the Financial Times. He is a frequent guest on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox News, and Fox Business, and is a regular contributor to National Review. He hosts the, the popular weekly podcast, Capital Record, dedicated to a defense of free enterprise and, and capital markets. He's the author of several best-selling books. Today, he's here to talk about his upcoming book, Full Time, Work and the Meaning of Life. Welcome, David. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So um, give us, first of all, a little elevator pitch for your book, and then we'll kind of dive into it from there. Well, I, I really do believe that um, the the world right now is in this bizarre mode of viewing work as part of the problem in society instead of part of the solution. And mm -hmm. I really wish that it was different in the Christian world. And I think oftentimes it isn't. I think that most pastors are sort of programmed to preach some kind of message against working too hard and all the sort of cliche cautions about ignoring your family and and careerism and ambition you know being a big negative and there obviously can be moments and times in which that there are uh pieces of truth there that have to be understood but i think the predominant theme uh that we take is just too often uh against work against the work ethic against sacrifice against the dignity of one being engaged in this productive activity that I believe God made us for, and that I believe is really the need of the hour for the health of our society, that we are increasingly seeing people with greater alienation, isolation. Um, there is a, a, a sort of belief that various therapeutic things can be useful to help get people away from the allure of work when I find work itself to be very therapeutic. And I say that uh, by God's design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you think we got so far off track? Why is it that people have that idea that work is detrimental to the things that quote unquote really matter? Well, it's a wonderful question. And I spent a little time in the book trying to evaluate that. I think that over the last 100 years, we've gotten off track with a number of things in terms of how Christians engage the public square, mm -hmm. how Christians engage being a part of society. So it's this age old question about Christ and culture. How do we live in the world when we're not of it? And I think the, the American experiment, the founding of our country, the, the Puritans, I think there's a great tradition out of the Protestant Reformation, and I think there's a great tradition even in Catholic social thought that was all very pro-work. Mm -hmm. And in the last hundred years, whether it be in the field of medicine, technology, law, business, finance, I think that Christians became more content with separating and mm -hmm. less content with engaging, mm -hmm. and that there was a certain surrender, a retreat from many aspects of the public square and the marketplace has been, in my mind, the most depressing um, collateral damage of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Over the last 30, 40 years, there's a lot of Christians that have re-engaged in politics. There's a lot of Christians who have re-engaged in education. We know mm -hmm. about the growth of the homeschool movement, Christian school movement. I know that there are those who are trying to gauge a better understanding of Christians in medicine and health. And obviously, I know that's the field you're passionate about. But how many Christians seem to be really re-engaging in the notion of dominion, stewardship, cultivation, excellence, performance in the marketplace, mm -hmm. uh, robust entrepreneurialism? I think that's a sadly missing ingredient. Mm -hmm. And so you think that some of this comes from like the separation of, it's, I guess, church and state, but now it's, it's not just church and state, it's also church and business. Do you feel like some of the reason why there people aren't as passionate about like um, the marketplace or entrepreneurship has something to do with the fear of like pursuing money sort of a thing as if that's been demonized? Is that part of it? There's no question. I think you make a great point there. And I have a whole chapter in the book on this yeah. where we equate some so often 
a high view of work, a high view of career, a high view of ambition with material prosperity. And mm -hmm. I believe, first of all, that there is something very appropriate and very acceptable about, about one pursuing greater um, uh, situation for themselves and their family. The Proverbs just over and over again hold out right. um, material prosperity as an incentive for hard work. But mm -hmm. yes, the reality is that I think what we need is a theology that says the work itself is meaningful. Mm -hmm. that we are serving others in our work. We can achieve some elements of our own self-interest in our work, but mm -hmm. we contribute to creation. We build culture. We build civilization. Mm -hmm. we, we, we really um, can mirror what our, our father did. Mm -hmm. uh, he created the world and asked us to go create out of his creation. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't create out of nothing. Right. He, he did that what they call ex nihilo, mm -hmm. but we can create out of the materials he gave us. Yeah. And so I often, you know, hold up a, a iPhone here, which is arguably the most successful consumer product in world history. Is and, it? Oh, wow. Oh, uh, well, I mean, certainly in terms sure. of profits and margins right. and, uh, yeah. you know, um, uh, by those types of metrics, uh, yeah. you, you, and how quickly it has permeated the, the society right. It's unbelievable yeah. for good or for bad. I mean, uh, you know, there's addictions and, and, and uses well, sure. of, of apps that, that obviously are a different story, but no, it's a really successful product right. and it didn't, it didn't come about till 2007 and it's been upgraded about 20 times since it in one little device holds more computing power than the entire Pentagon had 50 years ago. Wow. Um, but every single thing in it existed at the garden of Eden. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's new is mm -hmm. human ingenuity, right. human ideas. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that's the story of work. Yeah. It, that actually reminds me of the passage in Genesis uh, with the Tower of Babel, where it, from a negative standpoint, God looks down and he says, now nothing that they imagine to do will be restrained from them. Like there's so much power in what humans can accomplish if they put their minds to it. Absolutely. So, and, and of course that, and of course that passage in Babel, what's fascinating is it was men working to try to be God. True. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and yet we as Christians are called to work, to serve one another right. and, and to build a Christian culture. And it, in a way it be, work becomes the anti tower of Babel message mm -hmm. for a properly ordered Christian life. And that's it. I think so much of it just has to do with what do you place on the pedestal of your life? If it's work, then it becomes contaminated. But if you have God first and you put work in its proper place, then it can be oriented in a way such that you can glorify him. Uh, so speaking of that, identity and work. So what what is your perspective on how much or how little what we do as a career should influence how we see ourselves? Well, let me start with an obvious statement that's very uncomfortable for people. But when I word it the way I'm about to, they at least can't deny it, even if they don't like it. <laughs> okay. The idea that who we are is totally, completely separate from what we do is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. Nobody yeah. believes right. that the person laying on the couch all day doing nothing and a person who is out creating new products and services in an impressive way and developing the, uh, a really unique, well-executed business. Mm -hmm. um, that those are the two, that they're the same things, that th those people have no element in their identity that reflects what they've chosen to do with their time and resources and talents. The parable of the talents right, right. tells us differently. Right. Um, on an extreme case, because very few people are Michael Jordan or, or, the, you know, I think of uh, the, my, my daughter loved uh, the gymnast in the U.S. Olympics a number of years ago. And, and I thought, what a silly idea that they are, sep that what they've accomplished and achieved and why my daughter knows them and respects them and appreciates them is separate from the work they did to get there. It's the core of who they are. True. And, and yeah. I think a really appropriate way to say it that should be more comfortable for people is that work is not all of our identity, mm -hmm. but it isn't less than our identity. It, it may not be the whole of it, but it is at very minimum a significant part of it. 
-hmm. and that myself as a Christian man, I am also a husband and a father, and I am involved in a Christian school. I'm the a son of a, 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 a late Christian intellectual. There are different things that are a part of my story. There's a whole lot of things about your story, but what we do with our time and resources here on earth is indeed not only what we will most be known for, but also what God has expected of us. It's the, it's the heart of the burden upon our Christian life. Mm -hmm. And it's not mutually exclusive. Sure, uh, to, to, one of the things I want to do as a Christian parent is not just raise godly kids that are healthy and well-adjusted and, and that they feel and always have access to my unconditional love, which is, I think, the heart of being a parent but I want them to grow up to be great workers and contributors. Mm -hmm. And if all I'm here to do is love my kids so that they can grow up to love their kids, so they go to love their kids, and we don't ever get into the work element of it, there's this sort of um, unsustainability mm -hmm. of yeah. a Christian life like that. And so I do very much feel comfortable saying work is a huge part of our identity. Mm -hmm. So what's the quote? I don't remember who said it, but that we are what we repeatedly do. So the more we're doing something, the more that contributes to our self-perception and what we see is, is who we are. Um, so how do you see God's purpose for our lives? I know that's like a catchphrase, but how does that fit into this? Well, I think that you, I started in the book with Genesis chapter one, which I found for a lot of things is a great place to start for. A yeah, Christian. for sure since yeah. it's certainly where, where God started. And, mm -hmm. and I look to before sin entered the world, right. Or the, the fall, um, what God created us for. Mm -hmm. And when he describes the creation account, I see a God working each day again with the uniquely God-like ability to create out of nothing. And, and then um, appreciating his work at the end of the day and saying it was good. Mm -hmm. and I see him then on the sixth day, making us, mankind mm -hmm. and um saying it was very good mm -hmm. and that he had made us in his image mm -hmm. and then immediately chapter 1 verses 26 to 28 asked us to have dominion over the earth to mm -hmm. steward the creation to yeah. cultivate to grow it was a, a, an agenda of growth from work but god created the world with scarcity Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he created the world with a limited amount of animals and asked adam and eve to name the animals he created the world with a limited amount of apples and uh mankind was going to have to allocate who wanted this many apples versus this many bananas and and there was going to be this sort of economic process of human action mm -hmm. and of course the sophistication and complexity of it into a more modern form of work you know developed over time but that burden theologically that was reiterated in chapter two of us being the stewards to be fruitful, to fill the earth and subdue it, this was what we were created for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when sin entered the world, it didn't change that. It just added the awful dimension of sin yeah. to those endeavors Mm -hmm. And there were going to, there was going to be pain in childbirth, and there was going to be work, uh, toil and snare on the field, right. uh, in work. But never at any point did it change the the issue that we were created for. And I think that's where I start mm -hmm. in my understanding of this. And I think it really plays into the understanding of a healthy Christian life. Yeah. So, what would you say to somebody who believes that there's one thing? That they should do you know somebody who's trying to figure out what to do with their lives from a career standpoint do you believe that there's one thing that god has for each individual one career path or are there many possibilities that could all glorify him or what's your take on that well i think it's going to be different for a lot of people and i think it's going to be different in a lot of uh seasons of history there were it was um it was more common uh 40 50 60 years ago that people were trained in one thing and they would often do it throughout their whole career and today there is more reinvention and there, there is more development. And I think one could be called to a particular vocation, a season of life, and be called into a different vocation later. Oftentimes it isn't even a different vocation. It's a different employer, Sure. right? Yeah. That they have a skill set that one day they're doing at company ABC and another day they're doing XYZ. You know, myself, 
Um, I spent many years as a managing director at a very large Wall Street firm, and, and I left and started my own firm. It became more of an entrepreneurial call, and mm -hmm. yet I'm still delivering the same services and operating out of the same skill set right. uh, that I had previously. So these things can sometimes change on the margin, but not holistically. But mm -hmm. I, I am quite sure that there are plenty of people that go through a more holistic reinvention Mm -hmm. you know, I guess the one caution I have is I think sometimes people do it for false um, r Christian reasons. That is someone who is really, really good in technology and has a great job and working hard in it. And then they wake up one day and they quit the technology job and say, God called me to go plant a church. Yeah. And 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 maybe he did, but sure. maybe there's a, a, a poor theology that is telling you the technology work is inferior spiritually yeah. to the pastoral work. And, and that's really what I wrote the book against. Got it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And so there's, what if, I mean, think of, I think a lot of people have this idea that God has this great, big, high calling. What if somebody finds themselves doing, you know, entry level day-to-day -day work that doesn't seem glamorous? Can they still find value and joy and God's purpose in that? I think, honestly, this is going to be the hardest thing for me to um, properly explain out of the book, because, and I knew this going in. Um, I, I'm, I think it's a very good question. I think it's a very tough subject, but I have really strong opinions about it. The, the challenge will be that some could very easily and accurately say, you know, I'm turning 50 years old this year. I'm in a middle-aged part of my life. I've been very successful financially and professionally. Um, and and one could say you have uh, a reasonably high profile, high income job. It's easy for you to say work is great. Right. Uh, sure. You know, I'm in a, the grind. Um, I've had frustrations. I don't like the work. I haven't found something that animates me. And I, the reason I want that objection to come up is because I want to be very clear that my life did not start, my career did not start where it is now. Mm -hmm. I um, have no college education. My father, who was my hero and best friend in the world, passed away when he was 47. I was 20. My mother was already gone. Mm -hmm. And I had to start with no money, no resources. And it was really God using work as that healthy diversion yeah. that produced not only a lot of cathartic and therapeutic benefits, but it was... Um, that element that enabled me to have a journey. Right. And and I found the journey far more rewarding and satisfying than the destination. That and and so that that's where I want people to understand that they, they could be in a place where it seems um that there's a lot of drudgery, but that that there needs to be a perspective that leads to something that uh, is more satisfying and that they have that opportunity. It's a choice one can make in a market economy mm -hmm. to marry their passions to their skills. Yeah. So that, as you're talking about the journey, what popped into my head is Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. Yeah. And what you described sounds like the perfect starting place of where you were versus the, the journey to get to where God has you. And I'm sure that there's plenty more to come. So what do you say about the opposite end of this spectrum when people can swing too far over into workaholism? How do we balance that? Well, I, I think that the the balance uh, is, to me, found in scripture. Um, this notion of something called the work-life balance, I think, is very problematic yeah. because, because it acts as if our work and our life are at odds with one another. Our work right. is part of our life. Sure. And, and for those who don't believe me, try going home and saying to your spouse, I'm trying to balance you into my life better. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I don't think it would go over very well because okay. our spouse rightfully sees himself as an integral part of our life. And that's where I think the work needs to be as well. Yeah. The, the language I think is a little more biblical is the work rest paradigm. Mm, okay. It's not a work life balance. It's a yeah. work rest paradigm. Rest was made by God for us. Mm -hmm. And, and I believe that the um, six days of working and one day of rest, it will at least provides even apart from the specifics of how one theologically applies it. Right. Just, just at a high level, mm -hmm. it provides a mathematical ratio 
Yeah, for sure. And I think it's very, very rewarding. And so yeah. when a young person comes in and wants to know, before I take this job, I want to make sure I get you know, four weeks off here and I'm going to leave early Fridays and I get to leave for the gym and I get yoga time every day. There's a generational issue here yeah. that is putting too high of a reward on something before dues have been paid, mm -hmm. before one is kind of earned into a little greater degree of margin and freedom yeah. and outside of the work rest paradigm that I think is what I would use as the kind of model in scripture. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you're specifically saying that that ratio in and of itself is what we need in order to be optimally healthy and not necessarily more. Yeah, I, I do believe that. I, I don't I don't think that um, that is a perfect ratio uh, every season of one's life. I expect sure. that one in their 70s is, is going to have um, different health and 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 physical and, and, and mental you know needs and, and realities. Yeah. Um, but I think that the reality is it was God's model mm -hmm. and he created us in his image. Yes. And where did I get the idea that just because he did it, we should do it. I got that idea from him. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, so I've noticed at least with some of my patients, I'm curious to know if you have the same opinion that taking a full 24 hours off sequentially is more restorative than taking 24 hours spaced out like little chunks here and there. Yeah. So I usually will tell people if you have to do it in chunks, then you can, but it's better if you can put it all together so that you can actually have that restoration. Would you agree? I would. And I guess even though you're sort of interviewing me on this podcast, I'd love to ask you a question because Please. I wonder how you advise patients on the one obvious challenge in that it seems not only very medically clear that it's restoratively superior to have that 24-hour chunk, it also seems much more exegetically clear that that's what God actually said, a Sabbath day. Absolutely. But it's technology is mm -hmm. that the, and I, I struggle with this myself. Um, my wife and I try to take vacations together, get weekends away. We have a, a, a couple of houses we own that we use for that purpose. Um, but the phone is always there. The email is always there. I wonder how you mm -hmm. counsel patients to deal with that because it's a somewhat newer phenomenon. Absolutely. And I think you have to guard your time. And that's what I mostly tell people is create the intention ahead of time so that you can set yourself up for success. So if you intend to be off grid, be off grid, make sure that you set aside specific times that you're going to check your email or your phone and the rest of the time have it on airplane mode or have it out of sight so that it's not something that's going to constantly pop up because we have, you know, the, the culture does is structured such that we're always available. And that can certainly take you out of the time of being, uh, being present fully in the moment and being able to connect with people, with other people in our lives and with God and with, you know, what he, what we, what he would have us do from a rest and relaxation standpoint. For sure. One, one, one thing that I found is that doing that is a lot easier when you don't um, broadcast it, publicize it. I see people go on social media to say how they're going off social media, mm -hmm. or even when I've sort of announced to my family or whatnot, like, I want to know, I want you to know we're going, you know, device free or whatnot. Yeah. It, when it's being done somewhat pharisaically, it's harder, <laughs> it, it's harder to stick with it. True, yeah. But when you have this sort of internal resolve, you're going to try that discipline of disconnection yeah. um, and it isn't something you've broadcasted to the to the world for a certain attention. Sure. I think it's I think it's more likely to be successful. Absolutely. I'm actually reading a book right now um, called Willpower Doesn't Work uh, by Benjamin Hardy. And uh, it does structure the idea. It's, it, it's about the idea of structuring your life such that you don't have to make decisions so, like that. You've already made them in advance. You've already set your environment up such that it is going to help to reinforce the decision you've mm. already made. So I think that can be really beneficial. And as you say, it's not about, hey, look at me, look at the great you know decision that I've made so that I'm prioritizing the right things. You just do it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, absolutely. So what do you envision if people, if Christians were to begin to get this idea 
of going into the workplace, going into their area, their as um, I don't know if you know of Lance Wall now with the the mountains of influence, but the various mountains of influence in society, which is like business and economics and um, education and all of those. If we were to really do our best in our various areas of influence, how do you think that would change the world? Well, I think that in both bottom up and top down, it is the lowest hanging fruit to change the world. That mm -hmm. our ability to use elections in the political cycle or, mm -hmm. or our ability to even just only talk about the pulpits and Sunday morning messages change the world. There's efficacy in all of those things, the sphere right. of church life, the sphere of political life. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about the um, leverage in mm -hmm. the marketplace, and the ability for more Christians to permeate entry-level jobs in, in hundreds of different sectors throughout the economy, and mm -hmm. then to become, you cannot become at the top of a field mm -hmm. without starting and building up. And I think that we need both. Mm -hmm. We need a significant amount of Christians that are at entry-level positions, filling the offices, doing good work, developing a reputation, letting their light shine before men, earning the respect of peers and colleagues. Uh, it grows an in influence. It grows God's kingdom. Mm -hmm, absolutely. But of course, it also then leads to more positions at the top. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will use the word power pejoratively, like I'm suggesting I want Christians to have power. And I, I don't think of it that way. I think it's about influence. I think it's about a witness. I think that there is, um, uh, when we can have more influence and positions in, in various fields, medically, legally, uh, and uh, it's certainly the entrepreneurial environment, mm -hmm. uh, having Christians that are making the devices that become successful consumer products. Right. Uh, there, there's just something that would be totally transformative to the culture. Mm -hmm. And yet, if we settle for mediocrity, mm -hmm. we can best get by, we can at best survive, but mm -hmm. we cannot thrive. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that so many believers are afraid of what success might do to them if they make a lot of money or if they find themselves climbing the corporate ladder or if they find themselves with influence, thinking that that's going to corrupt them. And of course, there's always the possibility because those things are are neutral. They're neither good nor evil, but they can be used for good or evil. But if we subjugate that to the Lord and we have that perspective, then we can actually use those things for his glory. Absolutely. Well, that's right. And you know, there's a verse in the Proverbs that talks about someone saying, oh, I can't get out of bed. There's a lion in the street. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And and it's Proverbs being sarcastic about mm -hmm. that excuse making. Yeah. I do humbly believe that a lot of Christians that say, I'm worried about having too much influence or, or you know, the money and the prestige going to my head. I suspect that a lot of those people that they're not as worried about that as they might say. Possibly true. Possibly true. Yeah. So what have I not asked you that you want to make sure you leave with our audience? I just really do want the audience to know that in my defense of this robust view of work, it is a pro-family message. Um, it is true that I understand that there'll be people in their work commitments in the vision I have for work that sometimes miss a family dinner, sometimes have to work late. There's yeah. trade-offs in life. And yet this is not about saying I pick career over family. Right, right. It's about saying that the holistic Christian life cannot allow family and, and other commitments that we care about, church, community, et cetera, as to be an excuse for ignoring this element of the Christian life. Mm -hmm. It is really unacceptable socially, uh, theologically, in a community to say, yeah, I work really hard, but I just don't hang out my family at all. No one is going to tolerate it. Right. But it is not a socially unacceptable message mm -hmm. to say, I'm really devoted to my family. I don't care much about my job. I do what I can to get by, but I'm really there for my, my wife and kids or husband and kids and so forth. That message is greeted with almost enthusiasm. True. Yeah. I think they're equally unbiblical. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. So where can people go to get a copy of your book and learn more about you? Well, the, so the book is certainly available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble, all the normal spots, but we created a website, fulltimebook.com, mm -hmm. that not only will have the uh, places one can go to buy the book online, but um, 
updates of clips and audio and interviews and other things that mm -hmm. just provide a little bit of a, a, a snapshot to the message and meaning behind the book. Mm -hmm. And from the fulltimebook.com website, they could link to my own company website, to my personal side. I do a lot of reading, writing, and, and so forth. And those mm -hmm. that are interested in all this types of stuff will find plenty of ways to stay in touch with me. And I would certainly love that. Mm -hmm. um, but fulltimebook.com is the easiest site to go to. Awesome. Well, I will link to that in the show notes. And thank you, David. This has been really entertaining and interesting. Well, I really appreciate having me. Thank you so much. Thank you.